Welcome to the Faith is Not Blind podcast. I'm Sarah Devigny, and we're pleased to be here in the northeast of England. We've been doing some traveling around Europe and around England to find some different voices, some worldwide voices, and today we're here with Jordan. Welcome, Jordan. Hi, Sarah. We're glad that you're here with us. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Could you describe a little bit of your early experiences in the church? Okay, sure. So, um, Jordan, I uh, was born and raised in the church. Uh, my parents were, were converts, so they joined the church in Plymouth a couple of years before mm -hmm. I was born, uh, with missionaries knocking on their door. And my dad let them in and started to, to listen uh, and liked what he heard. Uh, my mom was interested, but was uh, less keen to be involved in the missionary discussion. So every time the missionaries came over, she would go and get a bath, she would go upstairs <laughs> and excuse herself. And uh, as a story goes, over a period of time, I think when my dad decided that he wanted to join the church, because um, my mom would always come down and ask questions afterwards. You know, after the missionaries had gone, she was like, what do, what do they teach? What do they, what do they yeah. learn about? Um, and so one day, um, um, they, they set a bit of a plan with the missionaries. They'd pretend to leave, the missionaries pretended to go. And then my mom came running downstairs to ask what they'd, what they'd been learning about that week. And then the missionaries were still in the front room when they, were, when they came downstairs. So um, from that point onwards, after she got up to the embarrassment of probably wearing a bath towel when she came downstairs from the bath, um, she sat in on the discussions and they joined the church from there. Yeah, what a wonderful story. Um, <laughs> How old were you at the time? I wasn't born then, okay. so that was just before I was born. And then they moved up to, to Scotland and I was born a few years yet later. So I, um, I grew up in the church. Um, we moved to the northeast probably when I was about nine or ten years old. Um, had very much that kind of childlike faith growing up, you know, like you lost a, an action figure and you would say a prayer with the full expectation that the Lord would tell you where it was. Uh, I remember one distinct moment, we were on a car trip and um, we were running low on, on fuel. Um, my dad had kind of said, everybody pray that we can make it to the next kind of mm -hmm. petrol station. I remember being a, as a kid, like kind of this, saying a prayer in the car, like hoping that we'd make it to the next petrol station. And, um, and we made it there. And I, I could actually see what I thought was the fuel gauge kind of going, going up, right? I was just like, this is amazing. This is like this transformational experience for me. I found out later that that was a speedometer. And so, <laughs> so as we were going, like kind of like, it was just going up and down. I was just like, oh, it's all according to my faith. But it's this very kind of innocent, childlike faith going up. Um, and then kind of as, as typical when you move into your teenage years, that, that starts to change a little bit, right? You know, so I remember doing my first year of, of seminary. Um, it was home study back then. Yeah. Uh, so it was the, you get the pieces of paper, the sheets that you were filling in and, and writing each week. And I was just not um, bought into it. You know, it was one of those things that was a pain to do. And, and my parents would try everything from encouraging to incentivizing to bribing to, to try and find a way to get me through my first year. Uh, and I just about scraped through my first year. Um, but I had a phenomenal seminary teacher. Uh, it was right on the cusp of when they changed from home study to early morning seminary. So this for me, you know, I'm not an early morning person at all. I still, I'm still not now <laughs> at 38. Um, and so they changed to, to early morning seminary. And I remember my parents probably thinking, there's no way Jordan's ever gonna go to, to, to seminary. But I had a phenomenal seminary teacher at the time that was very patient and very kind and said, you know, like, I don't mind if you sleep through the class, just, just be there, just, just come. Try it. Wonderful. Um, and so that's what started. I started going to seminary then. That was in my second year of seminary, so I was 15 years old. And um, I guess kind of initially I was just kind of there listening and seeing, seeing what was there. You know, I had a couple of questions. And the more the time went on, the more, the more intrigued I got. Right? So this was starting to move from this childlike faith of going to primary and accepting everything that was told you because that's just the way it was. Your parents are infallible. Everything's amazing. Through to starting to have a few of my own questions. And um, I guess that's where my testimony really started to come from. There was one particular lesson where we've been talking about agency. And I had this real concern, I guess, that often you've kind of been taught that God knows everything, right? He's omniscient, he knows absolutely sure. everything. But yet we are agents and not objects. We have the ability to choose, we have the freedom to choose. And I, I couldn't reconcile in that particular class how the two could exist, you know? Um, so for the first time in my life, I guess I'd moved from this just accepting everything that I was taught to having a question that I couldn't figure out the answer to. And bless the, the class and my teacher, like they spent a, a, a huge amount of time, in fact, probably the entire lesson, like trying to give examples and to kind of help me, you know, get it. But, but at the end of the class, I still wasn't bought in. It felt like, you know, if, if God knows everything and, and if we truly have agency, how, yeah. how can the two coexist? You know, this, there has to be all this element of, of predestination or something baked, baked into it, or the illusion of choice. Uh, and that didn't sit well with me. Um, 
And I remember my, my seminary teacher at the time just being like, encouraging me to you know, go home, Jordan, and, and pray for an answer. And I was a little bit skeptical, I think, if I'm honest. You know, I kind of went home with this view of like, well, okay, we couldn't figure it out in class. I've been given like the, you know, the general answer that we always get in the church. Go, go home and pray, it'll be, you know, it'll be all right. But I did. Um, I think more of it just out of that urgency of wanting to know, like feeling that I had to kind of get settled yeah. like in, my, in my heart a little bit. And, um, and so I prayed. And that answer didn't come immediately, but um, over the next couple of days, I got an answer that was personal to me. Uh, and it sounds silly, but I'd, uh, as a child, I played a little bit of chess with my dad. I don't claim to be a, a, a chess, chess expert or anything like that. But I played a little bit of chess with my dad, and, um, and we had a chess table in our, in our dining room. And I remember one day, as I was still kind of wrestling with this question, like kind of walking through the dining room and seeing a chessboard there, and I thought, there was just this thing, just this, I don't know if you want to call it prompting or feeling or something like that, but there's just this little thought that came into my head that says, well, you know, you're thinking about agency in terms of the choice in a very linear manner. You know, like I get up in the morning and these are the choices that I make and Heavenly Father knows all of the choices that I make and so then I get to the end of my life, where has that choice really been? But consider it in parallel rather than in sequence. Think about it like a game of chess. When you have a chess board set up, there are a ton of different moves that you can start with. You can bring out your knight, you can move your pawn forward too, you can do this kind of stuff. Over the course of the game, all of these moves could exist in parallel until you get towards the end of the game where somebody, if they're outsmarting, you can say checkmate in three moves. You know, yeah. I've had an infinite number of choices to begin the game. All of those choices could run in parallel, but the further that game progresses, the more it's honed in and honed in and honed in until you know the outcome. And I, you know, I'm sure if, like, kind of from a theological or th philosophical point of view, you can kind of pick holes in that analogy. And I don't claim for it to be a completely complete answer, but as a, as a 15 year old boy, for the first time, it was like this aha moment, right? Like this, actually, it's not just linear. It's not just that God sees this kind of life that we live as an all knowing God. He can see everything in parallel. And it gave me a lot of comfort. And that was really, I would say, the, the, the formation really of my testimony that that God had heard my prayer, that he'd been considerate or kind or caring enough to give me an answer that was personal to me, yeah. that let me continue to move forward. Yeah, let's break that down a little bit. I, I want to step back from sure. it and analyze it because as you talked about, your initial experiences with prayers were about action figures, about finding where <laughs> your action figures were. Yeah. And then as you developed and your toys got more complicated That's right. <laughs> and you moved to the chessboard, God was able to answer through the chessboard and I think that's a nice symbol of sort of going from something relatively simple and childlike to something more developed. And, and some people wonder, how could you find an answer in a paradox? And are paradoxes dangerous? Because that, that's what you were entering. Sure. Why do you think for you it was important for you to progress that way and find an answer in something more difficult than just where your action figure was. Right. I mean, I think, I think what I found as time has progressed on in the life today, that, that, that God answers us in very personal ways. Yeah. Uh, and often, you know, we can, your experience is not my experience, but often we will kind of um, project our experiences on others. This has worked for me, so it must work for you. you right. know, it's kind of, this is our idea or concept of truth. Therefore, yeah. it must be true to all. And we kind of, we, we have a tendency to project that. And, and what I, what I love is that even with eternal truths that exist, you know, that, that God has are a certain eternal truths, but the way in which we learn our experience is very different. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, if we do accept the principle that God is a loving God and that, that each of his children are different and has different profiles, that ability to teach through different mediums and over different times and over different experiences yeah. is, is, is tailored to us. You know, I have three young children at home, right? So Nate, who's, who's eight, Callie, that just turned six, and, and Connor, who's two and a half. And as a parent, I guess I just naively assume that they're all the children that grew up in the same home, therefore they must have the same or similar experiences. <laughs> but they have got, even at this age, wildly different personalities, and they learn in completely different ways. And so as a parent, and uh, certainly a fallible parent, right, but kind of those teaching opportunities for each child is tailored to them. You know, and, and I just kind of think that that is almost like a, like a microcosm of what God does for right. all of his children. Right. And, and the connection to agency is interesting too because if he's answering in a way that we can understand then that helps to preserve our agency as Absolutely well right. the individual individualistic aspect of answers to prayer and revelation 
how it's to preserve that agency that you were trying to reconcile and understand. That's right. So as you got older and matured even more, went to university, what experiences did you have that continued that maturation process? Because mm. I think it's important that, number one, each person's experience is individual, and number two, as we mature, we have different experiences, sure. and, that, and that's okay, yeah. and, that, and that it should be age appropriate. So as you became more aware, what were some other experiences that you had? Sure. So I am, um, you know, if you fast forward from that kind of early seminary experience, um, got to 19, um, I went on a mission, um, bearing testimony to everybody that the gospel changes lives and that kind of stuff. And certainly remember as a missionary kind of praying for those, you know, you're praying for on behalf of an investigator, somebody that's looking at the church, that kind of thing, and saying even the challenges and the trials that they have, you know, pray and it will be okay type thing. But often that was based on other people, you know, this kind of, this, this thing of it will solve their problems. But, but often I kind of went through it, I guess, still a little bit in this bubble, right? And even kind of coasted a little bit through, through university, a little bit of spiritual apathy cre creeps in, you know, you're focused on your studies, you're going to church, you're doing the right things, but it's so easy to coast, you know? And then I remember, like, kind of in my second job um, that, that I took, I was, so I was a newly married man, um, my wife, we met back when we were 18, we are childhood sweethearts, <laughs> you know? and we got our first house. Um, and all that kind of responsibilities of, of adulthood started to, to set in, you know, you've got a mortgage, you've got bills to pay, you've got all this kind of other stuff. And so I'd taken this job, um, and it was a hard job. It was a real, it was super interesting, but just this real stretch, just this real stretch in terms of uh, I'd never done anything like that before. And, um, and what became apparent over a period of time is that, that I put my life and soul into that job, you know, like working through the night uh, to the early hours of the morning. Some instances I was kind of going to bed as my wife was getting up and mm -hmm. going to work, you know. And over a period of time, that, that had started to... Um, I just think put a strain on, on me personally, um, a little bit on our relationship, um, on just kind of the life in which we're living, because I, 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 felt, I felt a little bit trapped, I think, if I'm honest, you know, that you were in this world where, because of using my agency, because of choosing to pick this role, yeah. I then felt like, okay, but, you know, the church is all about self-reliance, and I want to provide for my family, and I want to do all these kind of stuff like that, and I felt this kind of thing of, I was trapped in a scenario that I didn't necessarily want to, to be in. And that, that didn't sit well with me. And I, rem I distinctly remember there was a, 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 a time, that I, well, a couple of instances actually, when I was out on the road uh, driving for my job. And just for the first time in my life, I'd never suffered from any kind of you know, depression or anxiety, as far as I was aware. But these feelings of doubt started to creep in in terms of the, there's no way out of this. You know, it's not worth it anymore. And um, it was alarming because there was these like, little pangs of, Maybe, maybe, maybe now you should call it a day. You know, maybe, maybe it's easy to drive into the central mm -hmm. reservation. Maybe it's easy to, you know, those kind of thoughts, and it scared me. And um, and I remember going home one night, and I say for one of the first times in my life, outside of that, you know, preaching that the gospel of Jesus Christ is good to solve other people's problems, when I felt so independent myself, I needed it to solve mine. And so. Um, so I knelt down in my office, I had a small, small office at home, and just poured out my heart and soul to my Heavenly Father. You know, I, I, I can't do this. I don't know what to do. I've reached the end of everything I know, my, my knowledge, my, you know, where, where do I go? And um, I remember just this feeling of just comfort and peace that it's going to be okay. You know, just almost like the chessboard, and like, that there'll be, there'll be an answer to this. Even though you can't see it in the moment, Jordan, there'll be an answer to this. And literally, kind of a day or two later, um, my wife and I had been sat in the kitchen. We'd had, I don't know if we'd had a couple of fights that week or whatever it is, but just because of the stresses of work and that kind of stuff. And there's this really strong impression of, you just need to tell Debbie how you're feeling. You need to share with her what you're going through. You, you need to kind of cleave unto your wife and nobody else here, right? <laughs> And so we were sat in our kitchen at home, and I shared with her kind of how I was feeling, and I, you know, I felt kind of trapped, and there was no way out, and I didn't know what to do. I wanted to provide for my family, I wanted to do the right thing, but I just, and she just kind of took my arm, and she wrapped her arms around me, and she's just like, you know, Jordan, it's a job. You know, if, we, if, if, if you need to quit that job and move on, and we need to sell our house, that's okay. You know, if we need to move back in with our parents, that's okay. Like, kind of, we're, we're the most important thing here. We're the most important thing. 
And it was just that complete feeling of like relief. You know what I mean? Like that this kind of that, that, that pressure no longer existed, that kind of sense of what's most important here is your relationship with your wife, your family, versus anything else that can be going on in your life. And so um, with that in mind, you know, I'd gone to my boss at the time, who I respected and had a huge amount of respect for, and we found a way out that I could effectively start to move roles, and that kind of came good. And actually, that next role that I moved on to set a chain of events in order that fast forward now a number of years through different roles and connotations has led to the job in which I do now, which I'm extremely mm. passionate about. And it just set a, this kind of chain reaction kind of, you know, in order. But it came back to that moment of almost, again, reconciling kind of choice and agency right. with God knowing everything. But then this additional component of him being all loving, you know, so with using knowing everything and with being all loving and respecting my agency, this ability to still kind of bring this together to help me move forward. Yeah. When you're in that moment of helplessness, I think it's important to recognize how difficult that is for a lot of people, especially because your expectation was that if you did everything that you were supposed to, you would naturally be happy. Right. How did that change your perception, not just of agency, but of happiness and, and where it would come from? Sure. I think it's a great question. I mean, I think often we do, or it's so easy to kind of grow up in the church with uh, this kind of binary way of viewing things, right? So I live righteously, the Lord will bless me, I'll be happy. Yeah. And there are plenty, you know, countless of people which, which live according to their beliefs, which try to do the best they absolutely can and still undergo trials, tribulations, you know, like, and uh, suffering over an extended period of time. And so, you know, you kind of think about almost like kind of classical, classical conditioning, right? Like kind of, it's very easy, like, like a Pavlov dog moment, like I ring the bell, you know, you're, right. to let you're like kind of all this stuff. But it's not, it's not that clear cut and that straightforward because our perspective is often like kind of, I do this, I get this reward, or I do this bad, I get this punishment. And the reality is if, if, if God really does love us and we're his children and he wants the very best for us to become like him, think about the characteristics of God. He's like loving, he's patient, he's long suffering, he's kind. That needs to be developed over a period of time. You can't just give somebody that. I can't just give that to my children that they're, you know, that they're patient. They have to develop that over time through experiences, some of which are hard experiences. Yeah. You know, and so it was this mindset shift for me, I guess, slowly but surely over a period of time, I can't tell you a defined moment, but this, 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 this paradigm shift between I do the right things, I get blessed, to I do the right things and trust that Heavenly Father has my best interests at heart. And even though I might not fully understand the, the situation in the moment, I know that over time, that this is ultimately for my good. And that was that kind of shift that happened for me. Right, and it sounds like your wife giving you permission she, she to was, experience it fully and to focus on what was important, that helped you feel like it was your choice. I mean, for Debbie, like, she, she's my, she, I'm not only my wife, but my best, you know, my best friend. And, and, um, and she gives fantastic counsel. And it's one of those things I think, you know, about the dynamic between husband and wife is that sometimes when you're in the moment, when either spouse is kind of in the moment and you feel like you're kind of your judgment clouded, having that, that you know, that third party, that somebody that can yeah. kind of just, it's okay, you know, let's consider, let's, and so we could counsel with each other, yeah. as husband and wife, and, and that was huge. And so your roles and your jobs, those didn't have to fit in a binary with her right. either, which could help you preserve your choices and your happiness. Let me ask you one last question. Sure. Now that you've sort of worked through that, maybe there's a little bit more happiness per se in your, in your job. What, what helps you stay knowing that it's difficult and it's not always clear cut? What helps you stay tethered to the gospel and to your family and to all of those relationships so that you can Remember that it's about becoming like God, yeah. not necessarily happiness from moment to moment. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I'd say two, two things. So firstly, you know, often when we, when we again, members of the church that, that grow up, it's very easy to kind of focus on this um, often deferred gratification, right? So live good now and it pays dividends in the future. There's a big payday that comes. You live in your mansion in heaven, you know, everything's yeah. great, right? If you're suffering now, it's okay Don't because worry, eventually, yeah. And so it's very much like that kind of just endure, just endure, it'll come good. And, and, and firstly, I would say that kind of constant reminder that 
you can experience happiness and joy now, right? You know, when you read the, yeah. when you read the scriptures and you ask about the, 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 the Nephites and the kind of the journey that they've done in the wilderness, like they go through trial after trial, right? But it talks about in the scriptures them living after the manner of happiness, after the manner of happiness. And I think day to day we can still find and live after the manner of happiness in the moment now. And it's not just about that deferred gratification, you know. Yeah, and it, it may be changing our perspective so we can see happiness rather than Absolutely. just one definition of happiness, Absolutely that it's a right. perspective Absolutely shift. Right. We, we can still find joy, you know, in the, in the journey. It sounds cliche, but you can find joy in, in the moment. If you can see it. If you can see it. Yeah. The, the second thing is, I would just say, you know, again, when you when you grow up in the in the church, often like the textbook answers are in, through primary, through 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 youth, it's always like read your scriptures, say your prayers, go to church, right? That's the that's a simple answer, and then you encounter this complexity in life where actually it's, it feels a lot more complicated than that. I mean, for me, I don't think I've necessarily fully moved through that kind of simplicity to complexity back to simplicity again, or simplicity being complexity, but I do think that some of the answers I still experience today, now or live now are the same answers that I gave back then. You know, so how, how does daily prayer really help me? And it, it forms that relationship with my Heavenly Father. It's that regular touch base that I can share with Him how I'm feeling and I can feel that, 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 that love or that peace that can come from just pouring out your heart and soul to a being that you know that loves you, that's your Father in Heaven. Yeah. How does reading your scriptures kind of, they provide answers in your day-to-day -day basis. There's, so, there's countless experiences, Sarah, where you know, in my job or in my calling at church, like I'm, I'm searching for answers. And something, maybe not even the content, but something comes through in the scriptures time and time again. Almost like I've asked my question to God through prayer. The answers come to me often through the scriptures. By attending church on a week-to-week -week basis, that constant top-up, that constant reminder, you know, and it could be through serving others, it can be through listening to the sacrament prayer. But those three answers, which seemed so simple back then, mm -hmm. For me, in my personal life today, actually are the three things that generally keep me, keep yeah. me going. Yeah, well, I love that because, sure, they're primary answers, they're simple answers, but the way we receive them is more complex. The way we feel them is more complex. The relationship is more complex, right. even if the foundation is very similar right. to those days, seeing the gas gauge right. and and thinking that it's something else and thinking sure. it's an answer to your prayer. I mean, yeah. it's, it's wonderful. Because you've gone through this kind of knowledge, assimilation of knowledge, that you learn that these are the answers through to the application of knowledge. Yeah. So by, by doing those things and by experiential learning, it now becomes embedded more in who you are rather than just these are the answers, Jordan. You know, yeah. just in that, that journey. Well, and it seems very clear you've internalized these things, which is the whole point, that that's what gets us to have the relationship, not the external equation, but the internal right. yeah, processing. So thank you, what a great example and a great story. We appreciate Thanks you so a much. lot. Thanks, Thanks. Jordan. Cheers.